that's good. That's good. That's good. a little bit less blinding. Yeah, that's good. I just want people to be able to see you when they're up here. Anyone that wants to get your flute, do you have are flute players in here? Right, we're flute players. Anyone that has their flutes with them, bring them up here. And, and, and if, ever, any, if people would please join us up here, that would be great. Join us, join me up here. Have a seat somewhere here. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> Chairs, we might need a couple more chairs. Sure. The only thing in here next is lunch and trying instruments and stuff, so if anyone wants to stick around, certainly can. Caroline, you don't have your belt over there, do you? Yeah, you want to get it if you want, if you want, because I never, we never t talked again after that. Yeah. The last time I looked at it, you weren't here. 
some width. Oh, I see. <laughs> so is it tarnishing or it's, it's yeah. Okay. Well, definitely I'm going to have my tools out for them to, to do you think you can get it and come back before two? Yeah, that would be good. You get checked in on that. <laughs> anyway, okay. So, oh, let me go. So it looks like we have relatively good chairs. There's an extra chair here. Okay, so if you have your interest, go ahead and take your boots out if you don't mind. Get them put together. And hi, my name's Adam. I know some of you already. Um, and I own Polluter Street. And this is Joey Boyce over here, who is literally the right hand of everything Polluter Street. Um, and, uh, and we're here to talk about wellness of our instruments today and how that can to our own playing um, and our sense of accomplishment or achievement on the instrument as well. Um, and so uh, I thought what we could do is, I know for a lot of you I've done little tweaks and stuff to instruments before. Um, what I thought we would do is I'm going to get my light set up and basically what um, I want to cover with you is uh, taking a look at some of your instruments, maybe doing a before and after play test as I make changes so you can hear some of the results for yourself. Um, you know, we spend so much time learning how to play the flute, you know, learning all these ideas about technique, what repertoire we should be working on, and, and all of that stuff. And, um, can I have a water bottle? It's right over there. Joe, is my green water bottle over there somewhere? It's fine, if not, I don't know where I put it. So, okay, that's fine. Um, so anyway, we want to make sure that the instruments are serving us, right? And the instruments are not fixed, like, they're not unchangeable, they change, right? And there's a certain degree of changeability and flexibility built into the instruments mechanically. Um, and so usually, if the flute is of decent quality to begin with, the instruments don't usually break. They usually just start to kind of slowly fall out of adjustment, usually at a point where you might not notice. And so it very slowly starts to happen to you where eventually, a couple weeks, a couple months later, you're maybe experiencing some hand tension or some TMJ or some extra tension in your back or you're having trouble, you know, maybe you think I haven't warmed up enough, my long tones aren't working. Very often it has to do with the condition of the instrument itself. Um, and, you know, it would be really nice to know when it is you, right? And it'd be really nice to know when it isn't you. Um, either way, there is an expense and a responsibility involved with um, looking out for yourself as, as your own skills and whether or not you're practicing and keeping up with whatever you're trying to accomplish. And then also looking at the instrument and making sure that you're taking equally good care of the instrument as best you can. And I know all of you, you know, have probably had experience with flute repair, who, or, or getting your flute repaired, or have needed to get your flute repaired. You know, it's not particularly inexpensive, right? It can actually be expensive, and it can be uh, logistically difficult to schedule at a time when you really might need it. So we often get emails or uh, outreach from um, clients that want to get maybe a full COA or something right before a recital because they, they feel like they want to sound their best for a recital, which is wonderful. What I wouldn't do is make too many changes to an instrument right before a recital, right? Because you want to be familiar with it. And the last thing I want to do is change it and then you pick it up and you're like, can you put it back? No, you can't put it back, sadly, right? So knowing when it's you or when it's the instrument is a really important thing. So what I thought I would do is start down the line and I'm just gonna, um, uh, the other thing we'll do while we, while we do this is we'll talk about some of the parts of the flute. I'm gonna ask some questions to see if you can name some parts of the flute because it's very important when you do have a problem, you know, you can call uh, on people like me and our team at Flutistry and if we can help you over the phone, we will. There are many times I've been, um, you know, Saturday, night, seven o'clock, right before performance at eight, helping someone on FaceTime fix their instrument. 
But if FaceTime is not possible or you have someone that knows repair, you have to know what you're talking about on the flute in order to get that quick help you might need. Or if you want to search how to fix something on Google, which you might find, uh, these days so much is available, um, you have to know what you're looking at, right? what you're trying to address. So I thought while I look at the instruments, we can um, talk a little bit about the parts. And then, uh, of course, questions at any time. Uh, but the other thing is to, um, hold on a second, sorry. Um, we want to uh, get uh, parts of the instrument addressed and then also talk about some common problems with the flutes that we all might have experienced before. And you're probably not alone, come to find out. Um, and how many of you in here teach flute lessons? Yeah? So, or will teach flute lessons, want to teach flute lessons, right? Knowing if you're working on trying to get results for your students and help them get results, um, you know, it would be really helpful to know when it's the instrument and not them, right? Uh, and I have to tell you, I've seen that at many different levels as well. I've been um, in, you know, really wonderful master classes where I happen to know the person that's playing in the class, um, and I know what instrument they're playing, I know the repair condition of it, and I hear some of the commentary from the guest teachers and stuff for that particular player, and it's stuff that neither one of the people on stage know is the instrument's problem, right? And what a different type of experience that might be for the player and for the teacher if they had that information, right? or at least knew when to ask, is that the instrument? And usually, someone like me, they see this logo and they see me standing on the other side of the table, and not everyone thinks that we know things like that. Um, but we do, and it's very helpful, um, especially to be able to test your own instrument and be able to tell when it might need to be looked at by someone. How often should we be getting work on our flutes? And what is work? Does anyone have any ideas? Don't be shy. Well, I roll around the floor here. <laughs> Sorry. Usually it's about a year. About a year, right? Um, oh, good. This will work. So, about a year, and why is that? What do you think? So every year you want to check in because there could be a couple more, a couple right. more pads that might need to be. Yeah, it's about maintenance, right? Now, a brand new flute is not always, and this is kind of the sales side of things, which is important because there's another factor. What if the instrument is playing in great condition, but for some reason you still can't accomplish the things that you're trying to accomplish? Very often in that case, it might be a skills thing and a, and a craft thing where you have to practice and work out that technique a little bit more, but it might also be that maybe the instrument itself is not a great match for me. You know, I want to get involved with, I don't know, racing racing cars, right? Am I gonna take a Toyota Corolla? No. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can soup it up or have someone that knows, I don't know much about cars, but I know that's not it, right? So it's kind of the idea of thinking, well, what are you trying to accomplish and what's the best tool for you to accomplish that thing and what condition is it in? You can have the car, but it might need an oil change or the tires need to be rotated, which could cause you major problems in an actual race if you don't take care of it, right? So, and I like to use that analogy. I don't know if anyone has seen on Netflix this really great series, and this is related to repair for you called Formula One. Has anyone heard about that, seen it? It's, I'm not a race, I'm not a car person, a race car person at all, but I, it started one day, just started on its own, and I was fascinated by the talented drivers and this incredible team of people behind them. There are some teams that have you know, two or three drivers, and they have like a $100 million budget for one car. And the team of people, the pit crew that you see, but also the people designing the cars, making sure, watching the screens during the race to know what's going on, it's fascinating. And the flute is very similar. And so a lot of things I do, I just came from Boston, and then uh, I was at Rice University yesterday, and, you know, I get to work with players at all sorts of different levels, and we abuse our instruments. That's the truth of it. We abuse our instruments. And so never, uh, you know, delay in getting your instrument looked at when you have the chance. So I would like to start with, does anyone know they have a problem with their instrument particularly? Great. 
Sarah? Right? Yeah. Okay. So you don't need to tell me necessarily what just yet. Oh, I need my visor because I'm blind. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite figured out the, the what are these called? Transitions or whatever they are? Were they progressives? I haven't figured out progressives and, and looking at Lucy yet very well. Okay. This is the official costume with the lenses here. All right, so what am I doing? Checking for leaks. I'm checking for leaks. What kind of leaks? When we say leak, what does that mean, Norman? Do we know? Ultimately, pads, what? Not sealing. Not sealing, right? Now, something very interesting about the pads, padding, there's usually what we call partial leaks and whole leaks or what once a fluid is finished, it's not really a whole leak, it's, a, it's an adjustment leak. So there's two kinds of leaks. One is where the pad is not touching 360 degrees around the tone hole surface, right? Sorry, I'm not, yeah. Where it's one part of this circle is not touching the tone hole, but the rest of it is, right? That, how would we fix that normally? Anyone have any guesses? If there's a part of this pad that's not touching the tone hole, but everything else is? Shins. Shins. Shins, right? You put something in behind the pad to push that part of the pad down closer to the tone hole and hopefully it evens it out, right? Um, so that's a shimming or a partial, a partial leak. That's how we fix it. Um, but how do we tell where it is? We look at every single key on the flute as a clock face. 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3, 9, right? So when we look, when I'm looking for leaks, I'm looking to see what part of the clock is leaking, what time is it, right? And I'm making note about not only what the hour span might be, but how thick I might want the shim to be to fill in that space based on the pad type and the material that I'm using to do the shim, right? So that's basically as complicated as flute, basic flute repair gets, is shimming of pads. Now, so that is when a pad is touching the tone hole, but it's not sealing all the way around, right? An adjustment leak, and for those of you that have adjustment screws on your flute, who's seen an adjustment screw on a flute? Who's ever heard an adjustment screw on a flute? Yes, right? So that's an adjustment leak, and an adjustment leak, they're there to address adjustment leaks. Adjustment leaks are when there are two keys that are supposed to be regulated or timed to touch their tone holes at the same time. What would be a pairing of keys on the flute that's an example of that? So F, are we talking about right hand one? Yeah. Yep, and so that's the F key. What what keys does the F key uh, affect? And this is why we need to know names of keys, right? So we're gonna go down the flute, are you ready? Okay, we're, this is left hand one or C, right? Now we're just gonna work down what's called the main line of the flute. So the main line, C, do we know what the next one down is? A sharp. A sharp, yep. At Flutistry, we tend to use all sharp, just so that we're always using the same terminology uh, when we're talking about the keys. So A sharp, what's the next one down? A, that's right. This gets a little bit trickier. The next one after A? G. In this case, we call this upper G and lower G, okay. right? Technically, uh, this is actually G sharper and this is G, but not the way we think of playing them. This is just which tone holes they actually cover, but in flute land, it's upper G and lower G. So the upper G is the one you touch, the lower G is the dependent key, right? So, um, okay, and then what do we call this one? The one with the point on it or the one that you don't touch on the right hand directly with your right hand? Any ideas? I'm talking about the actual, because uh, we have the lower G, right? And then the next one down from that. I heard it. F sharp? F sharp. That's F sharp. Okay, a lot of times we think of F sharp as being our ring finger. But now use your ring finger on the flute and you can see that it actually, it has nothing to do with this key. 
that is simply a mechanism for you to press this down without having to reach over to do it. So F sharp is actually this key right here, right? So some people will say, oh, I have a problem with my F sharp. Well, is it the F sharp not speaking or is it the actual F sharp key? Because if it's neither of those, then you're saying you actually have a problem with the E. Yeah. So I've given that away, F sharp. Then what's the, what's the next one now? This would be right hand one. F. F. And then the next one down? E. e. Next one? D. D. This is oh, D sharp. D sharp. D sharp. D yep. And then, C sharp. and we call this low C sharp. So you'll see in my notebook, like L C sharp, L C, which would be the next one, low C and L D, right? Now on the back of the flute, this is called the back of the flute. We have upper and lower trills. We have the thumb, right? And this is the thumb key, the B tone hole. But this other key next to it that's on top of it is the B flat thumb. And why is it the B flat thumb? Because it works your A sharp, right? So now what's this key? This um, tone hole. What do we call this? G sharp. G sharp. Yep. So do you think you can remember some of those? Yeah. So that's going to be really helpful because now when I ask the question, what keys are dependent on the F, right? What the F does, which are they? Say them out loud, you got it. A sharp and lower G. A sharp and not lower G in this case. Because I'm playing, I'm pressing F. So it's A sharp and what'd you say? F sharp. Can you see that? And F. So that's the most complicated relationship on pattern, on a flute, because A sharp has to be sailing perfectly, perfectly. Forget the other keys involved. It has to be touching its tone hole, perfect. F sharp also has to be touching, it's independent of everything else. When it goes down, it has to be sailing around the whole clock face. And so does F. But they're all related. So I can either add or subtract thickness between these relationships to move like a teeter-totter the keys up or down, right? Like this, and so I can regulate those adjustments. So if I can first establish that the pads are all touching their tone holes around the entire clock face, that's step number one. Step number two then is then to adjust everything so that when I press F, all three keys are going down and touching their tone holes at exactly the same time, right? So. These are all things that move. We're in Florida. I've now lived here for two and a half years, three years, and it's crazy, the humidity outside, even the humidity inside, uh, but especially around in a state that most places that you go, unlike New England where I'm originally from, most places you go around here are just cranking air conditioners. We all got it on in our cars, right? So you're, you're outside having coffee, whatever, walking across campus, and then you get in your car and you put it down on the floor, maybe on the passenger side or something, and it's right under an air conditioning vent, right? So the things that respond to um, humidity changes and temperature changes actually affect your instrument. The stuff moves, right? Um, and so that's what the adjustment screws are for. If something changes that's out of favor for you, maybe you can do something as simple as turning a screw one way or the other to readjust that relationship, right? Now on custom flutes, there are generally, generally speaking, on custom handmade flutes, there are not adjustment screws. What's used instead? Does anyone know? There's still adjustments, but it's not done with a the screw. There's something else that we do between the pieces of metal. I call them bumpers. Bumpers? That's one way. These are, these are bumpers or kickers that are on the tails. See these that have pieces of felt on them? Bumpers and kickers. That's one part. That's to keep the instrument quiet and the key height's at the right height, um, which helps with the scale if it's venting properly. Um, but in between the actual, like where the screws normally would be, on like look at your flute and see where there's an adjustment screw. Can you look and see? Can you point out an adjustment screw? Does anyone have where they can? I'll walk around and look and see if you can point to an adjustment screw. You got one on there? You might have one behind, and if not. There? What do you do? Oh, wonderful. Yes. 
so there's no adjustments for her, obviously. But there are adjustments here. So what, what would be there instead of screws right here? Do we know? Um, Underneath the screws? Little tiny shims of either paper or sometimes plastic, but it has to be quiet, yeah. too. Yeah. Yep. So that's always a trick, is to find a stable material that's quiet and adjust the screws. It's really thin film. Well, you know, let me see if you don't play off this thing. Here, that would be an adjustment screw. Yes, and if you're gonna use really thin felt, that would mostly be on kickers because it's quiet, but it's not particularly hard. Unless they use super glue, and then it gets noisy as hell. Yes, exactly, and they can, because the, the materials can smack and make a lot of noise. Oh yeah, this is the hand. So you know what's gonna happen on here? You're just gonna have paper adjustments, right? Paper and, and plastic adjustments that do the regulation. Can we, did we do yours already? No. What is this? Uh, That's okay, oh great, so flip this over. Can you see the screws under there? Yeah. Yep. So those are some adjustment screws. You don't have a flute? Not right now. Okay, but you can see yeah. here's an adjustment screw. Mm -hmm. Right? Another one that we can see would be these ones right back here. Do you come down here? Mm -hmm. Yep, you've got some there. Blue. Blue. <laughs> we have a okay. <laughs> oh, and I have yours, yeah. You know your your adjustment screws, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, you've got yours. So and now that, by the way, just makes the distinction, the difference between the instruments. Um, there are generally three classes of flutes that we can get. And we know, right, you see a table full of flutes, and you're like, oh my gosh, well, what's the most expensive flute on that table? They're only getting more expensive, I can tell you that. Um, unfortunately for all of us, it's, they're really, really, and there's just nothing to be done with precious metal is that really that expensive. And how long do you think it takes to make a handmade flute of skilled craftspeople? in every part of the process. I've seen a year. I've seen a year waiting. A year? Oh, you've seen waiting lists, absolutely. Usually it doesn't take a year to make it, um, but they have to schedule it out so that they can fit it into their calendar, and once the orders fill up, it could be a year. There used to be a time where it was seven years, six years, seven years when some of the major makers um, could get a flu. You just order it and wait. Um, how many hours, I guess, is the question, do you think it, makes to take, to, it takes to make one custom flute, generally? It's anywhere between 120 to 150 hours, depending on the, the metal being used. Some metal has a stronger memory, takes longer to settle. Um, excuse me, it needs some readjustment. Also, there's the padding and, and all of that. So the amount of hours skilled craftspeople goes into it is why instruments end up getting so expensive. Because it's not just 150 hours of anyone making a flute is like the best flute makers in the world, right? So you want them to be efficient and you don't want them wasting precious metal that's expensive to buy. So they need to know what they're doing and, and get it right the first time, basically. That said, there's a lot makers can do to fix things that don't happen right the first time because they, they just remake, you know, they can re-solder re, re and, and readdress and remake a part if they need to. Um, so there is a reason that the instruments are expensive, but there are three classes. The first class would be basically beginner flute, close hole, C foot, all the way up to roughly these days, it's between, it's like 35 to 4,000, 3,500 to $4,000. That range of flutes is actually all a similar class. And what that means, um, in, from my point of view, is that the way the instruments are made, um, if they're made from a reputable manufacturer that's using quality materials, so the material is strong enough, right, to, to hold the adjustments, um, the, uh, they're made exactly the same, whether it's a C foot close hole flute or an open hole B foot flute with a solid silver body, right? The materials might be different. You can get maybe a C sharp trill or a split E or a gold riser or a gold plated lip plate or a blah, 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 whatever it is. It's all the same quality make of flute, right? Some have different features and more precious metal, so it costs more money. And there is great artistic value in the difference between let's say a silver plated open hole instrument and a solid silver body open hole instrument around $4,000. Um, and generally, what is that difference? Does anyone have any ideas or guesses about what that might be? Between let's say a silver plated open hole flute with a B foot and a solid silver open hole flute with a B foot, that's, uh, that's you know $3,500. What's the difference by having that material? What do you think the difference in the material might be? Yes, because it's what? It's heavier, so you have to like push more air through it. 
Yes. Yeah. So basically it requires more physical engagement to get that metal to vibrate, right? So if we have a bell in front of us and we keep changing the material and the thickness of the bell and the size and shape of the bell, how we swing the mallet at it is going to make a difference on how it rings, right? Which is why when you're trying instruments, it's always a bad idea in my view. Uh, it's a good idea maybe straight away to prove to whoever, hey, if I, maybe I need a new flute, right? Because you can hear that this new flute sounds way better than my old flute. That's as far as it goes. Because our instruments teach us how to play them. And so when you're trying instruments, I think it's always a bad idea to be playing your instrument, your current instrument, and then the new instrument back and forth, back and forth. Because what it's doing is you're saying, this is how I sound on the bell that I'm used to ringing, right? And then you move the bell and you put a new bell in here and you do play it the same exact way and you hear none of the benefit of why you would spend more money on an instrument, right? So it's great to hear at least initially the difference, but then you really want to just explore the new instrument, mm -hmm. right? So you can find it. And that's very important. Um, and that is also related to this idea that the instrument can be a mismatch for somebody, right? The way you swing the mallet and what kind of mallet you have could very well affect, uh, will definitely affect how the bell rings. And so if the way that you swing is not a good match with this particular bell material and shape and size, it doesn't matter whether the bell is in perfect condition and you're in perfect condition, the match is not right, right? And that is something that is very interesting to consider and most players don't consider it because there, there's no information like this that it even matters. Um, and so, you know, my hope today is to bring to you, let you know the instrument has so much of an impact on how you sound and feel about yourself as a flute player. Who wants to like take the flute out whenever you take it out to practice and know what you're gonna sound like? <laughs> Isn't that the thing we all want, mm -hmm. right? It would be really nice not to blame something, but to know if it's you or the instrument or maybe your match with the instrument. It's not usually someday you go, oh, I've outgrown my flute, just like a switch usually. When you're young, someone usually tells you if you're taking lessons or, or you have the chance to play something and you start thinking about it. But you might even be a professional with maybe even a very expensive, you know, nice quality uh, custom flute and it, you still might have outgrown it or evolved in a different direction as it is intended to ring as a bell, right? So. Um, Anyway, the first class of instruments is that beginner through step up, top of the line, step up intermediate, okay? The second level is what I would call the professional level where it's pre-professional, where when you get into the professional level, that ranges between 4,000 and let's say, the numbers have changed so much, I can't believe I'm saying this, but around 14, 15,000 is the range now. And what that is in the professional le level, excuse me, is a better made instrument. So everything takes much more time. They're way more particular with how much tolerance there is. Everything's much tighter so that the instrument can keep its adjustments a lot longer. But it takes much more time to work that metal and to make sure that all the geometry is right, make sure your padding is correct and all of that. Um, and so the instruments become more expensive. So at the professional level, you get a better made flute with better materials, stronger materials, but in order to make it only four or $5,000 at that pre-professional level, um, you're only gonna have probably just a silver head joint at that point and a plated body and keys. Does that make sense? So we've jumped levels and we've, or classes and we've stepped back to just the silver head joint. So then you can imagine the next level in that class is the pre, or the entry professional, excuse me, and that is the solid silver body plated keys version of that same finely made instrument, right? And then there's the professional top of the line level in that class, and that is the professional flute that is solid silver or some, like if you've ever heard of RMA or, or um, fusion metals or anything like that, where it's some silver, we call it silver plus, or something more than silver, but it's still top of the line professional flute. So the two classes are, Beginner to step up intermediate, professional. What do you think the third class is? I've used the word a few times already. I don't know if anyone's gonna follow. Custom. custom, that's right, absolutely. So now custom starts around 16, 17 now, which is still neat to me to think of. So silver, solid silver custom, right? And then it goes up from there. 
you know, 70, 70, there's one flute on one of the major makers price lists right now that's about 90, 98, $98,000. $98, if you want a C-sharp trill, it's officially over 100. What's that? If you want a C-sharp trill, it's officially over 100. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, it's crazy. It's very, very crazy. And therefore, all the more reason that understanding the playability of your instrument and its condition is really important. And find a repair person, a repair person that you trust, whether that's Flute Street Florida, Flute Street in Boston, or any other repair professional that you trust to give you information. Also, um, we're gonna go through just a couple of things that you can look for um, regularly that will give you an idea of, you know, what you might wanna be paying attention to to see. Usually if there are things going on with your instrument, it's a sign, like in the Wizard of Oz, oil can, oil can, <laughs> right? Something on this flute is telling you, it. I can tell at least it hasn't had work done in X amount of time usually depending on what the symptom is. Um, that said, there's all sorts of different conditions of the instruments and the different climates and altitudes make a difference in how things, how quickly things dry up and what things move and what things don't move. Um, but it's important to know the different levels of instruments, the names of the keys. We now, you now know things most people don't know. Clock faces, yeah. right? Yeah. So you think, you know for sure when you look at this, the E key, for example, that you, you know it's leaking in the front because you see a big old gap right there, right? You can say, I think it's leaking from six to nine, mm -hmm. right? And you could literally say that to a repair person and they'll know exactly, they'll be able to talk to you about that key and what might be able to be done, right? <clears throat> if you looked at it and told me, and this has happened before, <clears throat> I had a client that was auditioning for Juilliard and they were literally, I, I asked them to, to ask the person that was monitoring the auditions, if they could get a little extra time, because the flute is clearly not working. Okay. And um, they couldn't, they wouldn't change it. So um, I was like, okay, we're just gonna see how this goes. It's gotta be better than it's going right now. And it was that their key was leaking from, and imagine this on your clock face, it was the upper G, and it was leaking from basically six to 12, Ooh. right? So, and that actually happens pretty easy because not everyone hits the G key on top of the G. And what happens to that G key? That clock face gets pressed on the one part over and over again, and the key slowly bends, right? So if it's not broken, it just slowly went out, right? So the fix to that was go in your wallet, get a credit card, take it out, or get a, get a um, hotel key card and see if you can cut it and put it underneath the part of the pad that is touching the tone hole and press the key. Basically, you're just trying to tilt it back into place. So if you put a, if you take it, and I'll show you this, this. Show you about bending the key. Bending the key. We call it adjusting. Uh. Yes. <laughs> but you bent the key out of adjustment to start with. So, you know, and you did it just playing, so that's something to keep in mind. Solid silver, sterling silver, tends to be a lot softer than plated keys. Um, so it's often that we see even very expensive solid silver mechanism instruments with keys that need to be tilted a little bit. So this is an e example. This is like a hotel key card, right? So I've just cut, we've cut it and put it in, and just bent it into shape. I would just slide it right underneath the part of the pad that is touching the tone hole and I'd press on the other side and see if I can get the key to just back into place and maybe it's a little bit better, right? That is an example of a very, very quick fix. That would be an advanced fix, um, only if it was an emergency situation. But because we were able to speak about the instrument and what the keys were, I knew exactly, okay, and I was like, okay, it's a DS with solid silver keys, so it's actually gonna bend pretty easily, so they don't have to press very hard, right? So I was able to give that advice knowing what the situation was. Um, but what are other common problems on the flute that you've ever heard of? Low C sharp. What about the low C sharp? Tell us. Show, show where the low C sharp is on your flutes. Yep, great. Okay, so the low C sharp, which is this key here, right? Um, and this is a great example. So when I go to play a C, a low C, see how I'm just pressing the C down? Can you see that this one's leaking a little bit? Can you see that? Can you see the leak coming through? 
on the low C sharp? Yeah? Now, if I squeeze, I can get it to go away. Right. Right? But we, we, that's not a lot of strength when I think these, right? So now, when I play a C sharp, when I, or excuse me, when I go play a low C, my pinky is usually touching both the roller and the spatula, right? You see that? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. But when I go to play a low B, usually my pinky has come off of the low C sharp, and now I'm just touching the two rollers. Does that make sense? It's hard to stay flat there without hitting your D sharp sometimes, right? But everyone's fingers are different. If you are just touching the rollers and no longer the spatula also, and the adjustment between C and C sharp is not perfect, the C sharp will pop up and the low B won't come in. So very often, one of the most common things I hear is my low B won't work. And actually the low B is working just fine. It's sealing around the whole clock face. It's moving, there's no problem. It's that when you go to the low B, the C sharp pops up. And that is because when we play low notes, we squeeze and we stress and we also press. And when we press this key over and over and over again, just like the G's, the low C sharp bends. And this mechanism has to be really strong right here in order for that to work, uh, to be stay very stable. And certainly on sterling silver instruments, sterling silver is pretty soft, so they do move pretty easily and suddenly people's low B's are coming. But it's because the low C sharp is out. So you saw how there was a little leak, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my thumb, my left thumb underneath, like I tried that on your flutes, put your, 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 I don't want you to do the squeeze, but I want you to see what I'm talking about. See how I'm stabilizing the low C sharp spatula underneath my thumb, and I'm using the rest of my thumb to press against the bottom, right? So I'm underneath. Now, if I see that when I press C, it's leaking this little bit, I'm gonna actually press on the key arm itself, and I'm just gonna touch it a little bit and see if that counter action or pressing the key arm down and stabilizing the C sharp underneath will re-tilt the metal back to where it's supposed to be. And so while well, your low notes aren't coming out, and you can if you overdo it and you've gone too far, now the C sharp is touching first and it's not letting the C go down, you just press the spatula again and basically bend it back down into place. That's a very common thing where your low notes aren't working. And this is the thing. I'm not advising that you go bending your keys all over the place. <laughs> what I am saying is you've bent the keys already when, you play, when you're playing the flute. So if you know where to touch and what to do if you needed to in an emergency, it's certainly something that you can do. Unless you go and always remember, less is more. Always be conservative. Right, so if you think you're gonna try that, you just do it very lightly at first and see if you feel it move at all, right? Don't overdo it, obviously. The odds are you're probably not gonna rip the keys off the flute, right? Especially if it's your flute, you wanna take care of it, right? You wanna be careful. So, that's one thing that's common. What's another thing that's common? We talked about some of them already with the adjustment screws, right? Are there particular notes that go out more often than others besides the low notes now that we've talked about that? With what? E and the F sharp? Yeah. And oftentimes my flutes are too short on the bow notes, which would be the B. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that comes off. That's a whole bunch of different things. That could be regulation, could be could be kickers, not the right height, and all of that. Um, speaking of which, just other parts of the flute to be really clear about this. So we have obviously the hedge mate, right? But what's on the hedge mate? What is this? Lip plate. And then what's what connects the lip plate to the tube? The riser. The riser. And then what is this thing called? Crown. Crown. And what is it attached to inside? Cork. Cork or cork assembly, hedge mate assembly, right? But basically it's tube, plate, riser, and whatever's going on with the cork and crown, right? That's the hedge mate. Then on the flute body itself, we have, what is this called? Does anyone know? Barrel. Barrel, well done. This is called the head joint tenon, right. Okay, barrel, body, tubing, we already said main line, right? And then of course we have the key names, but there are other things that we see on the flute. Does everyone know what a rib is? See the like long straps, diamond strap, diamond ended straps that are on your flute? That the 
What are these things with the ball on the top of them called? Do we know? Posts. The posts are soldered to the ribs, and the ribs are soldered to the body. Now we have a foundation that's the right geometry to string the keys, and that's called stringing, like pearls in a necklace. Right? You want everything to be perfectly in line and to be beautiful and also work beautifully. Right? So um, then we have what's the what are the two these long tubes that the keys are actually attached to? What do we call those? Do you know? Rods. Rods. I would call rods the part inside them that they rotate in. Right, that's the steel rods, but this is mechanism tubing, mech tubing, or what's also known as hinge tubing, because there's a piece of steel in the middle, and then there's the, the straw, the metal straw that goes around it, and it hinges, right, as a hinge. So mechanism tubing or hinge tubing. And then you have the key cup, which houses the pad, right, and then you have the tail or the kicker of the key. And what is, well, I talked about this earlier, but what do the kickers actually do? They make it quiet, that's the first thing, right? Because for something to be stable, it needs to be pretty hard. But hard is loud, right? So that's the thing. So what we need, and, and what else do the kickers, what, what else do the tails of the flutes, they stop the keys from coming up, right? All the way, right? It, so the springs are up and then the, the key is here, the spring is here, and the tail comes down here. And when the key is up, the tail hits the body and stops the key from going any higher, right? That affects scale. Because if the key is higher, then what happens to the air? Does it come out faster or slower than a key that's lower? If the key is higher, does the air come out faster or slower than if the key is lower? Slower. Slower, right? Basically. Whereby it's not, it's not necessarily that it's slower, it's that not enough of it can get out fast enough and so it ends up vibrating a little bit further down the tube and it lowers the pitch. If the keys are much higher, everything can escape much faster and it's a shorter vibrating hall there and it's higher pitched, right? So key height actually, especially in custom flutes, is incredibly important because it affects both how the instrument feels venting wise, but also the scale. Um, okay, so those are what the tails do. They regulate key height, which affects scale, and they keep the keys plucked. Right? That's basically that. So those are kickers. Um, let's see what else. Uh, what are these things called? Rollers. Sorry, I don't know if you can see that. Rollers, yeah. Um, let's see what else I might be missing. Oh, and then you know springs. Can you all see where your springs are? So what about springs? Is that a common problem? Does anyone yeah, have a spring yeah. problem? Yeah, that's a common problem, right? So a little quick tip as well, hotel key cards I've used subway, like subway um, cards, also subway and restaurant cards, all sorts of cards. Um, but basically, you, you want to have stuff that doesn't have texture on it if you're going to touch a pad. There's a couple hotels I've been staying out lately that have these really beautiful matte finish hotel key cards. I'm like, oh, that's, I do graphics as well, so I'm like, that's so beautiful. But it has a texture on it, and that's like sandpaper, so I would never want to put that on a pad surface. Um, so something that's smooth. What about Gift cards, perfect, that works also. And the great thing about them, you cut them into any kind of shape you want. Um, sometimes you might want to use a little piece of sandpaper or something to just like make sure the edges aren't like super razor sharp so you don't cut yourself or the pads. But one of the things that you could do with this is you could cut the key card into any shape you want and put a little notch in the end and you've built yourself a little spring catch, right? So if the spring pops off, you can just put a little notch in the end and press it back into place. You can also, and you've seen people use pencils and what else have you used to try to put the spring back on? Anything? Dental tools. <laughs> What's that? Dental tools. Dental tools. Yes. I love that. Bobby pins. Bobby pins. Flathead. Flathead. You could use a flathead. You could also, if you had a hacksaw, you could put a little notch in the, in the flathead and you'll have a spring catch also. Right? So it's basically like there's fancy tools and then there's just like, what do I need to get the job done so I can hurt the flute? It's not, it's not rocket science. I just got to move the spring back on. Um, I was once at a University of Alabama football game. I went to the, the Roll Tide. I went to the, um, the homecoming game last year. And a piccolo fell. I was with the marching band, but a piccolo fell. I wasn't playing. Um, but a piccolo fell, and it came to me, and everything was like shifted, because when the piccolo hit the floor, all of the mechanism, the weight of the mechanism tubing, and this is taking care of your flutes, by the way, um, 
when the flute hits in its case even, or piccolo obviously out of its case on concrete, oh, surprised the keys were still on it, but they were, and when it hits, all the weight of these keys get slammed into the posts. So look at your posts for a second. They're just little pieces of metal. So what do the posts do? They go, oh, and they all tilt like this, right? And now the keys that are, that are, are held suspended between those posts are now offset, right? So I was at this football game with the little pom-pom thing that they gave me to, I held that over the post and I took my iPhone and I was banging on it. Oh. The thing, and I bent the post back into place. Oh, my God. Um, and then I got everything back together and it was sealing and I could not, the piccolo was so small, I didn't have any tools with me. Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to get the springs back on it. I couldn't get, I could not, I had nothing to get the springs in place. So we had, the flute professor was over here, and then one of the band techs was over here, and you know each person was holding a part, and it had car keys, <laughs> and I was in there like that, and we got it all done, oh right? So whatever you need, no. you know, it turns into making. Who knows who MacGyver is? <laughs> yeah, when I had hair, I had the mullet when I was 12 years old. I wanted to be MacGyver so bad. So anyway, there are very. It's just a machine. It's just. It's just. It's like okay, look at what's wrong, and just see what you can do to fix it, basically, right? Without doing more damage, if you will. Um, so springs are a common thing, right? What else are common? We actually were talking about them down here a little bit. Ten and where? What's that? Ten and where? Ten and where? And how does that affect the instrument? Well, or what? What's wrong with ten and where? You could have leaks, or even even more, actually, I think important is that, because leaking is possible, not so much on the head joint, sometimes on the foot joint. Yeah. Um, well, it depends if it's pickle or flute. But the think about this, you're working really hard to get the instrument to ring the bell, for the bell to be vibrating, right? And it's loose. Do you think it's gonna transfer vibrations very well if it's loose? What if it's really dirty and has like a black kind of greasy film on it? Do you think that's gonna help? It's gonna like insulate the vibrations, right? So I've already done things to this flute that you probably haven't noticed me do while we've been here, right? And I've just been doing little things to it to make sure that it is going to be ringing better, right? Um, and one of the things you can do is it's not just ten and wear. How does ten and wear get there? Well, assembly, poor, poor assembly habits. Poor assembly habits. Thank you. And Yep. I do that every time. And, and the and the tenon, that's right. The well. interior and exterior tenons. Yes. Right? So that's a really great um, that's a really great point. So you know when, when you're when you when you're in a really sunny room and the sun's coming through the window and there's all this like dust in the air? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well that settles on your flute. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that leave your cases open when you're practicing, mm -hmm. it's settling in your case. And then you take your flute apart and you put it inside, and now it gets some of that little schnibble, we call it schnibble, <laughs> on there. You don't see it because it's clean, right? right? You put it on and slowly over time, it's like sandpaper, it wears away the metal, unevenly sometimes. Also, it might not wear away the metal, it might just create grime and grit that insulates. But if there's grime and grit and there's any texture whatsoever, it creates this wearing away of the metal. Right, um, so we're gonna get to, I, I, and thank you for, for that, it was very insightful, poor assembly habits. I think that's great terminology. I did not say it. What was your name? Sid. Sid, Sid said it. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Sid. There is, there is one valuable lesson that's pretty rare that I learned from an instrument we were playing, we were training. Um, I had some problems with the flute. I took it in, he said, you have insect larvae in your case. Oh! Whew. Yeah, we've seen it. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you never leave a flute case open because mm -hmm. the flies and the insects will lay their eggs in the, in the wow. Yeah. Wow. Especially if you've been blowing your ham sandwich into the flute. Oh, God. We and call then, it lunch. And then we see once it. Once they hatch, they'll eat the pad. That's right. So we, so we have pad mites and stuff. And we actually have to be very particular when we have people bring in consignments because we've had that come in. And it does happen. Um, so yeah, those are some of the grosser things. Um, but basically, flutes are really dirty. They're really dirty things, right? 
Um, and so we, I won't, it, it is just before lunchtime, so I won't use too many of the terms that we use in the office sometimes when we get, ooh, we get some extra, um, extra lunch and coffee. Um, the French vanilla sent it to me. So. No. <laughs> it happens, believe it or not. It does happen. So anyway, and I, you know, I'm a black coffee drinker mostly, but, um, you know, and then there was a the time that the whole French vanilla coffee went over on someone's food. That was a different one. Um, so, okay, other common things, uh, other than some of the basic things that will happen over time, adjustment leaks will happen, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shimming will happen. As you play a flute in, right, the, the felt is going to squish and harden at different rates sometimes, so it might not break in evenly around the entire clock face, and so even though it might have been playing perfect the day you got it, you might need to have it adjusted in the first year, which is why certainly at Flutistry we have a, a free first year um, of adjustments and any padding and adjustments that are needed. Because we know, oh, you know, if you're a city driver, what happens to your cars when you're trying to parallel park, right? To your, your tires. But if you never parallel park, you're, you're doing a different, you know, you have other issues maybe with your vehicle. I have one question. Yes. What is your, what is your opinion of uh, reskinning pads instead of I don't think it's necessary. I think in an emergency situation or something where there isn't a lot of adjustment time, uh, it's certainly something that's relatively easy to do. They say it's cheaper than the COA. It's a, well, they're talking about the Sony pad. So. Yeah, it's it's you know at the end of the day when you pay to have a pad replaced, it's less about just the skin or the pad. The difference is a few dollars actually. Right. right. It's the time it takes to do it. And so if the pad, if, if the piece of micro suede or felt that's inside the pad is stable enough and, and hardened enough, you could reskin it and hope for the best. But really that is a free floating disc inside there. So once that piece of felt or micro suede comes out, mm -hmm. it's no longer perfectly lined up with the tone holes clock face. Mm -hmm. So 12 o'clock on the piece of felt that was in there might now be shifted somehow. Right? And there's all sorts of things. Sometimes you can look at flutes and see, yeah, this is a great example, actually. On your F key, at 12 o'clock, underneath, uh, you can see, I want you to look at this, and if you don't mind walking around so people can see it, if you can see it, do you see that black mark? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so when we take the pad out and put it back in, we're putting it back in at exactly 12 o'clock, and you see where the black mark is. So you can look closely at things, and you can see other people's repair work for your instruments. Um, and, as, and that's perfectly fine as long as there aren't tool marks, which is scratches and things. So what are um, some other common things? And then we're almost done, right? Okay. Any other common things? Because I have two that I want to point out. Yes, Joey? Did you have something? Oh, I, oh. You have, you have no, I'm more against it, so I'll see what your two more are. Oh, okay. Before I say it. What's that? Yes, which ones, which ones, which ones? Um, I, my old flute had a really big issue with this one. Who's had that, where the, what is that? What is that steel? That's a steel, it's a little piece of steel. What is it called though? That's the thumb steel, Yeah. right? Yeah. So who's had their thumb screw back out before? <laughs> yeah? Okay, there's two others that are common to back out. Uh, this one? Left hand one. And the way a flute is engineered, does everyone see where that is? It's right up here. If you've ever seen that screw coming out, and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna turn it back in. That's okay, you can do that. And you probably should. But usually, and, and there's one other place that often the steels come out, and you might not think of it right away. We started to talk about it a little bit. The rollers? The rollers. Has anyone ever had a roller back out? Yeah. And it rubs into the D-sharp. Sometimes the D-sharp might get stuck, or the roller almost comes off. So, and listen to this. Can you hear that? That's because the rollers are sliding back and forth on the steel, and there's no oil in there, so it's loud. Pop, 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 pop. And the reason it's the roller, and then the thumb steel, and then the left hand one is because those are in order the shortest to next shortest to next shortest, right? And that means they have oxygen very close, and it dries out very easily, right? So the rollers are very small, and there's a lot of wiggle room in there, so air can get in and the, the oil can congeal. And every time you use the roller, the oil, congealed oil is, you use the roller and it's literally gripping the steel and unscrewing it from the inside out and then it comes out. 
Same thing with left hand one hand thumb. And when that happens, yes, you can screw it back in, but what is the ultimate sign that that is giving you? You need more oil, you need better oil. That's the oil can sign, mm -hmm. right? You need more oil, and that is usually the first sign that you are due for a clean oil and adjust, or otherwise known as a COA, right? And that should happen on an annual basis if you possibly can. Um, and there's one other thing that is so, so important. How many of you have ever taken your flute out? Yes. What are you going to say? Well, I was, I was, it's the cord. The cord. Yeah. How many of you have ever taken the head joint out and heard this? Uh, th this. Where it's rattling, or you felt the steel, or the, the crown move. Have you ever had that? On your piccolo? Oh, okay, so yes. Yeah. Anyone else? You? Happens all the time? Yeah. So what that is, is that the cork is drying up and hardening and shrinking. And because of that, does everyone know that the flute head joint, piccolo head joint is not. Piccolo head joint is cylindrical. Mm -hmm. The body is tapered. Mm -hmm. On flute though, the head joint is conical. It's tapered. Smaller here, larger here. Can you see that? Yeah. It's a very subtle taper. You see that? So, the corks have to be the exact right size to fit by friction and stay where they should be. But when they shrink, they move what we call north on the flute. So north is the crown. What's the foot joint? South. South, right? So the corks move north. And when they move north, the crown, you know, the crown goes with it and now it's loose. And so what do you do? You tighten your crown, but you haven't actually fixed the problem. The problem is that the cork is moving. And if the cork is moving, that's going to affect two things on you. What? Intonation. Intonation, right? Because that affects how long the vibrating column air is. What else is it going to affect? Resonance, also known as tone, right? It's going to affect your tone because your job, we've just talked about the clock faces and the adjustment leaks, and we want to make sure everything is sealing perfectly, right? So that when you get down to your low B, as much of the air that you're blowing into the flute is vibrating all the way down the flute, right? And if that's happening correctly, then you have the chance to make a great big sound. But if it's leaking, it's got like a two hour leak on A sharp and a 1.5 hour leak on the F sharp and a four hour leak on the D, by the time you get down to the low B, there's no air left to get your low B out. But what if all of them are sealing perfectly and you're losing 20% of your air right out the top before you even get to all of this, right? And we don't think about that, we just tighten the crown. But actually, it's a cry for help, <laughs> okay? So listen to your flutes, please, and their cry. Listen to your flutes, please. And also, listen to the please of your flutes, okay? Um, because it will make a big difference in how well and comfortable and confident you feel you know, we've all had those lessons where we just can't quite get our sound and it becomes very frustrating. And, it, and I don't know about you, but for me, it certainly many times ruined my confidence mm -hmm. as a player. It made me nervous to be playing an ensemble in front of my classmates, in front of my teacher. And if it's one thing, it's if it's my skill. It's another thing if it's the instrument. And it's another thing entirely and a subject of a whole other class some of the time of whether or not it's, it could just be my match with the instrument. It could be something, something. My teacher wants me to do this, but the instrument wants me to do that. So when I do this on that instrument, it doesn't work, right? And that's the time to ask yourself, is this instrument serving me in its current condition and its current uh, perspective as an instrument? Because all of these instruments want to be played a certain way, right? And your flute's different from your flute's different from your flute, right? We all know how to play the flute. You blow and you move your fingers in a pattern, right? But how it feels to blow and to be the instrument is going to be different based on so many other factors, right? So find yourself a good repair person uh, when it's time. And for the rest of today, because it's time, right? We're done. So for the rest of today, well, we're going to be in this room at least until 2. Um, there are instruments here for people to try, lots of different levels, and my suggestion for folks is play them. It's, they're here, they're free, there's a lot of money worth of flutes on that table, and so if you don't need to buy anything, take a chance, take it for a spin, right? That's what they're here for. We'd like to hear your feedback, whether you're seriously looking or not looking, and if you have questions about your instruments, I'm going to be here since I'm already set up here. Um, Sarah Jane, we don't need this until three, right, this stage? 
Okay, so I can stay here and people can leave their flutes. Will you go to lunch? I can look at your instruments if you like. If anyone wants to stick around or come back after you're eating and watch, please do. Okay? Thank you.